Yes, yes. Uh, we are ready. Just a minute. Just a minute. Yeah, we are live. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this fifth session of South Asian architecture and uh, urbanism. We titled it South Asian Landscapes. Um, I am Rupali Gupte. I teach at the School of Environment and Architecture, uh, and I'm also one of the eight co-founders of the school. Um, you know, I mean, this, we started this series um, with this whole idea of sort of, you know, shifting the discourse of, of architecture from kind of our, our narrow ideas of nationalism to thinking of the idea of the region, you know, this idea of, of a kind of larger um, cultural landscape through which uh, we are operating through various kind of shared practices. Um, but also, I think more importantly, with uh, uh, this talk, I think one of the things that we've been doing at uh, the School of Environment and Architecture is sort of also expanding our own ideas of space. And we've articulated four kind of ideas of, of space, uh, you know, with one sort of thinking of space as the container, you know, with this idea of uh, Newton and Descartes sort of framing for us this idea of space as, as the container. And that's primarily where most architects operate from but also sort of then articulating the idea of space as, as a continuum. So beyond borders, starting to think of, of the idea of land and water, human and non-human, you know, sort of starting to think of space as a continuum. And, and I think the last series we had with the architecture in Bangladesh sort of also for us expanded those boundaries and, and sort of, you know, started to think of, uh, of architecture from the kind of ideas of, of continuum. Um, and then we sort of also have articulated the idea of, of space as, as a framework, you know, Kantian sort of idea of, of the framework through which we kind of imagine space. And the fourth one, I think the last but not the least is, is this idea of social space. And, and Lefebvre for us has kind of, you know, defined this idea of social space, the idea of space, not as, as given, but as produced. And in that respect, I sort of really am very happy to invite Professor Anoma Perry here because her own work for us articulates the space, um, the space of, um, you know, the social space, uh, which she herself kind of talks about as expanding the ways in which architecture in Sri Lanka has been looked at so far. Most of us sort of know architecture in Sri Lanka through the portfolios of individual architects. Um, and, you know, and, and in her words, through the ideas of hospitality. Uh, but she herself sort of expands for us this notion of space, you know, thinking of the idea of conflict and, and sort of uh, practice. Um, so um, in her talk, Spatializing Sovereignty and Civil War, uh, Professor Anoma Perry asks us, uh, you know, kind of a provocative question. She says, are architecture and urban disciplines useful for understanding the devastating impacts of an internecine conflict? How can we write about the physical and material effects of civil war? Uh, the lecture examines the changing spatial contours of Sri Lanka during wartime as offering new insights into human displacement, ethno-national consciousness, and a neoliberal politics. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce Professor Anoma Perry, who's a architectural historian and, the prof and a professor at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning, University of Melbourne. She uses the lens of architecture to address issues of sovereignty, citizenship, and marginality in South and Southeast Asia. This lecture is based on her recent book, Sovereignty, Space, and Civil War in Sri Lanka. Thank you so much, Anoma, for accepting this invitation and and helping us sort of, you know, expand our own sort of definitions of architecture and architectural space. Um, so thanks so much. And I would invite you to deliver the talk. Uh, just a, a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, I'm gonna switch off my video and, and mute myself, uh, but you know, whatever questions you have, I request you to place them on the question and answer session. Uh, in the in the section question and answer section and not in chat um, just so that we can sort of streamline some of the questions uh, we'll have a, a, a the lecture will go on for around 40 45 minutes and then we'll have another 45 minutes of discussion um, and it's it's pretty late in Australia right now it's we're four and a half hours uh, you know just uh, you know away 
and it's it's late and it's also uh, professor anoma perry is also very busy with her teaching schedules so we'd like to end um uh, in in uh, you know in hour and, and a half uh, from now so thank you so much for coming in uh, i just also want to kind of um, you know say that this this session has been organized by the school of environment and architecture and also partly sponsored by the urban design research in institute which has been uh, an important partner uh, in these talks with us um so with that i would invite uh, professor anoma perry to speak and thank you so much uh, participants and thank you so much professor for joining us thank you thank you rupali and uh, also anuj for organizing the talk and inviting me and sca mumbai for um organizing the whole series which sounds fantastic um thanks for your kind introduction rupali um i'm going to now share my screen and uh, begin the talk so i'm hoping that my screen is visible to all of you um this is um the title specializing sovereignty and civil war in sri lanka In 1978, the government of Sri Lanka moved its moved its legislative capital away from Colombo to Kotte, a suburb 10 kilometers southeast. Colombo, capital of successive European colonizers, with its fortified port and grand Victorian arcades, was demoted to commercial capital status. Kotte was the site of the pre-colonial city of Jayawardenepura, city of increasing victory. ascendant during the 15th century its revival was a grand symbolic gesture of indigenization of separating the sacred and the profane the actual physical remains of the city were negligible however abandoned due to colonial hostilities and internecine rival rivalries during the 16th century it had reverted to marshland the inner citadel and palace precincts were since lost in the conurbation of colombo So here you see where the old uh, city would have been and how it has been overtaken by development. Kotte was renamed Sri Jayawardenepura following its rejuvenation in 1978 by Prime Minister later President Junius Richard Jayawardena. His radical policies of deregulation and marketization were dressed in a new ideology of a free and just society conceived along Buddhist lines. The new capital and parliament would reinvent his United National Party which had been tarnished by associations with the post-colonial commonwealth. A parliament designed by architect Jeffrey Bawa in 1982 and in a vernacular aesthetic consolidated this shift. By moving the capital and indigenizing democracy along singular Buddhist lines the nation's post colonial status was spatially and culturally inscribed its ethno national and hegemonic assumptions were tested in the ensuing bitter civil war colombo previously vilified by national and socialist sentiment had no place in these post colonial dreams and even less so when concentrated separatist activity hardened into armed conflict while sri lankan government forces faced off against the liberation tigers of tamil elam in the north and east of the island colombo converted to a refuge for minority idps fleeing the war zone and grew upwards rather than outwards in defensive enclaves the city converted to an embattled post colonial cantonment with its buildings and spaces barricaded against its public ethnic pogroms suicide bombings and myriad checkpoints lacerated its suburban grid my interest in these cities and their separate discourses of political sovereignty for the starting points for a broader investigation of how disciplines like architecture might address the spatial changes and the circumstances that gave rise to them we celebrated the design of the parliament and the many vernacular inspired residences that sprang up around it in affirmation of its verdant setting the hospitality industry disseminated the image of cultural longevity and stability to broader global audiences both turned their backs 
on the social realities of war-related displacement and its impacts on our cities by providing aesthetic illusions of democracy. Eager to find a methodology that would allow me to investigate the spatial and material conditions of war-related developments, I turned to geography. My project looked at the various spatial units by which sovereignty is inscribed on the built environment, the home, the city, the nation, the arterial road network, the camps for internally displaced persons, the sites for post-war tourism, the new settlements for internally displaced persons, and overseas diasporic enclaves. I looked at how war transformed cities, not only in the war zone, but in the Southern capital as it braced for the war's effects. I asked how taken for granted spatial conditions were altered by violence and by the heightened human displacements that followed. The central argument of my book was that economic liberalization had raised the stakes on what could be gained or lost by communal identification and thereby had precipitated the ethnic conflict. Globalization had made the nation more porous and the population more conscious of their relative opportunities. Rather than look to the historical past to understand Sri Lanka's protracted conflict, I asked what we could learn from the physical devastation that was evident around us, both during the war and in the five year post-war period after it. The approach from geography forced me to pull away from the kinds of aesthetic interpretation favored by architects to a broader understanding of the island. I did so using a series of maps, in themselves a somewhat problematic approach because of the colonial history of map making and the ways in which the military and the LTT used maps. In the chapter Nation, I studied three spatial interventions introduced in the post-1977 era, which invoked the prowess of the ancient singular Buddhist monastic cities with their expansive reservoirs and giant stupas as providing nation building processes with historical precedents. These features evident at a micro scale in singular villages throughout the country were seen as disseminating that central religio-political ideology. By historicizing the accelerated development of major irrigation schemes for hydroelectric power generation and the associated creation of irrigation colonies as modern variants of ancient strategies of governance, foreign funded development projects were given cultural legitimacy. The monastic cities of Anuradhapura and Polonnaruwa that had been recovered by colonial archeology span were reconceived as part of a cultural triangle of UNESCO heritage sites which aggrandized and globalized the country's Buddhist past. A village reawakening scheme of 100,000 and later expanded to a million houses aspired to sedentarize the rural population along lines that followed that initial religio-cultural formula of village temple, tank, and paddy field. None of these interventions reached the minority populations in the countries far north and east. Separatism fired by discrimination and neglect proved a disruptive underlay to this persistent illusion of harmonious development in the free and just society. One of the problems of asserting majoritarian identity as the normative culture for the nation was the ways by which this marginalized minorities. By globalizing Sri Lanka as the host for Buddhism, using archaeological sites and developmental discourses that reclaimed the histories of Buddhist kingdoms, Hindu and Muslim minorities were increasingly sidelined. The vision of the Sri Lanka parliament, designed like the five-fold monastic complexes of Anuradhapura and surrounded by a body of water reminiscent of grand reservoirs, seemingly invoked associations of that glorious past. More significantly, ancient Jayavadhanapura was the 15th century kingdom which had subjugated the Northern Tamil rulers, unifying the entire island territory. These unsettling associations of ethnocultural ascendancy deepened communal divisions. Simmering tensions and violent outbursts came to a head in July, 1983, the infamous anti-Tamil ethnic pogrom, which I describe in the chapter Home. Tamil homes and Tamil bodies were marked by violence, 
and disenfranchised by those actions, many of them fleeing to refugee camps in South India. In this map, I trace the spread of violence between 24th to 30th July. Additionally, identifying the hastily created refugee camps and numbers who sought refuge. As a 17 year old schoolgirl, I was studying for my advanced level examinations at that time. The curfew concentrated our experience of the violence to our immediate neighborhood, preventing a broader understanding of its social spatial effects. Where did the violence start and how did it spread? What was the relationship to adjacent informal settlements from, in, from where many of the arsonists and looters came? So here in the different gradations of color, I'm showing you the different days uh, in which the violence occurred and the way in which it spread. The pogrom, which is identified as the July 83 riots or Black July, was the starting point for a new spatial taxonomy of camps. There were refugee camps that received displaced persons in Southern India throughout the war. The military camps and cantonments of the SLAF, the Sri Lanka Armed Forces, the LTTE camps deep in the jungles of Vaunia, and the conversion of ordinary buildings and institutions into temporary camp spaces. Towards the end of the war, there was an exponential increase in camps for internally displaced persons with the largest camps for around 200,000 persons organized like a miniature city with different groupings and related amenities. Such camps for the most part were too far away from urban centers for their extreme precarities to be understood. These were ephemeral spaces built of temporary materials dismantled and removed when no longer required. But despite the repudiation of their histories, they were the most significant spatial registers for documenting the war's devastating human effects. Following the riots, Sri Lanka descended into a period of protracted conflict where violence in the North was increasingly mirrored by LTTE suicide attacks and bombings in Colombo. It, it became a place of radical insecurity and intermediate refuge. Following a relentless chain of violence along these lines, the city was reconfigured as a battlement, barricading its public buildings against the separatist onslaught. Walls were raised, gateways surrounded by barbed wire, checkpoints set up at major junctions, and whole sections of the city closed down for public access. Areas in which the military were located or the homes of important politicians were removed from everyday circulation paths and concealed from public view. The map of the city developed gaps and omissions, new boundaries and fortifications. Passage through checkpoints, on-ground surveillance, guard towers and spot checks on vehicles thwarted a smooth pedestrian experience of the city. Colombo was the main stage for LTT attacks. Its most prominent buildings targeted either as symbols of economy or government, and its leaders and aspirants to leadership systematically taken out. In 2006, following an assassination attempt on the Secretary, um, the Min Secretary Minister of Defense, um, traffic was redesigned following a one-way system to reduce the number of stationary vehicles or head-on traffic. Colombo became a city in perpetual, in perpetual motion, caught in the maelstrom of the far-off civil war. The influx of Muslim and Tamil IDPs from the north and east, including both Tamil and Muslims, altered the demographic in the commercial capital substantially, with Tamils 28.31%, Indian Tamils 2.17%, Muslims 23.87%, exceeding the Sinhalese at 41.36% um, by the 2001 census. So this is important because with the influxes of refugees into the city, the ethnic composition of Colombo changed, uh, changed in favor of the minorities. As a colonial metropolitan center, Colombo was always more attractive to minorities than the indigenous cities linked to Singhala Buddhist pasts. It had several minority enclaves in poorer areas of the city, while middle-class minorities were dispersed in suburbs. The anti-Tamil pogroms led to the further concentration of these groups and subsequent transformation of minority enclaves to accommodate the population influx. Properties were catered through 
heinous acts of arson changed hands, reorganizing the social demographic. Multi-story apartment complexes intent on securing residential space proliferated in Melavata, Colombo 6, and Cotahena, Colombo 13. The areas most affected by these changes. So Melavata and uh, Cotahena were areas where um, Tamil populations had settled, but in um, small detached bungalows. So what you see here, which is very unusual for Sri Lanka, um, unlike in India, um, is a sudden kind of mushrooming of uh, high-rise buildings. The 1990s and after saw developments ranging from spacious condominiums with ocean views to one-room apartments without amenities. Vellavatta experienced rapacious development, strong arm tactics of eviction, and inflated rental and property prices for poorly serviced dwelling typologies. A multi-story manifestation of stealth architecture the fortification of minorities against future ethnic rights and their physical elevation rendered this suburb more visible while affording residents greater visibility. Following the incongruous insertion into Colombo's low-rise morphology, other suburbs would follow their lead. The upward rise of Colombo was instigated not by globalization as in India, but by minority displacement. So this is an image of Vellavatta taken in um, around 2011. Congestion in Colombo was accompanied by a second demographic shift of residents out of the city and into the new suburbs of Sri Jayawardenepura Kote, the administrative capital created in 1978. Whereas land was scarce in Colombo, it was abundant in Kote. The salubrious setting provided an opportunity for a different kind of lifestyle in a suburban villa away from the insecurity of random attacks and bombings. Indigenization linked to rural dwelling spaces was a form of post-colonial cultural reinvention envisioned by local publics and the nascent tourism industry elaborated on these themes. The shift also suggested a growing suburban Sinhala middle class, many of whom had benefited from economic liberalization. Sri Jayawardenepura and the southern coast of Sri Lanka as safe zones away from the embattled cities became incubators for a Sri Lankan aesthetic. In Colombo, in contrast, wealthier residents retreated into courtyard houses concealed behind high, high walls and refusing interactions with either neighborhood or city. During this period, not only Colombo, but also Kandy and Anuradhapura spaces whose economic or cultural significance had attracted LTT attacks were barricaded and placed under curfew, halting public life. Conditions experienced by residents in the Northern war zone were partially simulated in the South. The Jaffna Peninsula was carved up into 18 Israeli style high security zones, displacing residents and formalizing the military presence in the city. Everyday domestic suburbs, villages, and institutions identified in this map were converted into battlegrounds and refugee centers. The citizens were the collateral damage. Exoduses of the Tamil population of Jaffna in the face of the impending arrival of the SLAF and the LTT's expulsion of Muslim residents from the Northeast emptied out the city during the 1990s at different times. Their movements were also impacted by the multiplication of borders between SLF and LTT territories. The main rail and road arteries between Colombo, Kandy, and Jaffna were severed and reconnected at different points at different times during the course of the war in response to LTT attacks on buses and trains. Citizens traveling along these routes negotiated their identities and loyalties to ensure self preservation and they passed through LTT or army checkpoints, as they passed through LTT or army checkpoints. At the end of the war, following the defeat of the LTT, the suturing of these arterial routes saw new invasive forms of Southern tourism entering the North. Battlefield tourism to SLAF memorial sites and religious pilgrimages to recoup, to recoup formerly inaccessible Buddhist heritage sites heightened the tensions between Sinhala pilgrims and the Tamil villagers who were returning to these areas after the war. 
So this is an image that shows you uh, the routes that were typically taken by these tour buses that were full of senior citizens who were going on subsidized travel um, to see these Buddhist sites. And they were from the villages in the South. Capturing experiences in the war zone was more difficult for me because of my lack of access to primary material, but also my hesitation as a singular person to represent the pain of a minority. In the chapter Ruins, I recast the war zone as a site of ruination and a landscape of exile, applying the theories of R. Sharon and T. Shanathanan in their work, um, in their work, which looks at the ontological losses of the Lankan Tamil community. They describe it as a state of exile which they add to the Sangam period interpretations of landscapes as a valid spatial trope. This is a very interesting theoretical idea that came out of the uh, um, artistic practices of these two incredible people. So this, this space of exile then becomes a landscape of exile, which is then explored. In this chapter, I use it to examine three stories of how Tamil women householders dealt with the loss of their homes and their processes of recovering them. Destruction through arson and wartime requisitioning and the attendant depletion of the building's materialities was countered by individual efforts at rebuilding them. This gendered struggle augmented by the loss uh, of male or other family members during the war is echoed across the minority communities. It adds new perspectives to the meaning of dwelling. This brings me to the heart of the thesis of the book. Tropes like home, nation, or city are predicated on forms of ontological security which architecture substantiates. The destruction of the material conditions that create this secure sensibility, the uprooting and involuntary displacement of minority populations produces what I describe as ontologies of displacement which proliferate and multiply during wartime, producing a different unsettled basis for articulating sovereignty. So this idea of ontologies of displacement, in other words, the idea of displacement as creating its own ontology. I mentioned the porosity of borders as a subtitle for my book. The July 1983 program provoked an exodus of minority citizens out of Sri Lanka not only as refugees to India, but to other nations in the West. There they voiced their anger at the betrayal of their interests and many became advocates of the separatist cause. The politicization and vigilance of this Tamil diaspora intervened in formulations of national sovereignty through a counter and equally essentialist ethno-national framing, Tamil Elam. Due to the moratorium on news from the war zone, diasporic websites featuring this virtual nation of Elam, representation of the separatist cause that was being fought for on the ground, offered significant platforms for Tamil politics. So now I'm getting to, I have gone beyond the boundaries of sovereignty and I'm looking at how these boundaries are tested from outside the nation space. My research took me to two locations, Scarborough in Toronto and La Chapelle in Paris, in France, where Lankan Tamil diasporas had adopted the physical conditions, have, had adapted to the physical conditions that these two very different environments provide. In Paris, they occupied the ground level shops in the Hausmannian apartment buildings below the proper apartment spaces of the wealthier French citizenry. They traveled there daily from the banlieues beyond the peri uh, peripheric. Conversely, having initially mingled in the ethnic streets of downtown Toronto, the Sri Lankan Tamil diaspora later moved to public housing complexes or detached housing in outer suburbs like Scarborough. Here, one point of gathering was a small box retail complex in a parking lot. During the heated final months of the war, when diasporic Tamils, including LTT supporters, marched out in protest against high civilian casualties, their methods reflected the spatialities of their respective physical fabrics. In La Chapelle, they choked the narrow public streets between apartment complexes, but in Toronto, they formed a human chain across the Gardiner Expressway into the city. 
The body was also weakened by the Indian Ocean tsunami that brought international aid organizations into Sri Lanka, exposing the weakening of welfare systems due to economic liberalization. Foreign NGOs and the Indian government were among the key funders of IDP settlements in the war's aftermath. Here too, the sense of dependence on Indian funded housing eroded the fragile sovereignty being reasserted in the Northeast through military led reconstruction, a troubling use of former aggressors for peace building. High degrees of militarized intervention were also evident in the Southern cities most affected by the war. Violence was normalized through the, militarized, uh, through the militarization of civic spaces and activities. So now I'm getting to the post-war period in Colombo. The beautification of Colombo, as it shed its barricades and resumed the role of a nascent 21st century metropolis, was an extension of this militarized reconstruction ethos. In 2011, two years following the end of the war, the Urban Development Authority, the UDA, was drawn under the Ministry of Defense as a Ministry of Defense and Urban Development in a new partnership focused on national development. It became the engine of economic integration and market unification within a project of post-war nation building. The Metro Colombo Urban Development Project, jointly funded by the government of Sri Lanka with a concessionary loan from the World Bank, was launched in 2012 with the objective of turning Colombo into a world-class city and Sri Lanka into the wonder of Asia. Along with the familiar tropes of natural beauty, archeology span and traditional culture, a more dynamic vision of the nation, which might prove appealing to adventure tourists was launched. The envisioned metropolis for this new development vision was a conurbation of Colombo, uh, Colombo and Jayawardenepura and their peripheral municipalities. Three project impl implementation agencies, Sri Lanka Land Reclamation and Development Corporation, the UDA and the Colombo Municipal Council became involved. Several projects were initiated for, and I quote, ushering in modernity to the state, sound health to the nation and picturesqueness to the environment under the governing rubric of Mahinda Chintana, President Mahinda Rajapaksa's vision for the nation. As with Hausmann's Paris, this transfiguration was achieved through radical spatial dispositions and violent forms of individuation, removing landless families from underserved settlements and relocating them in multi-story social housing far away from the neighborhoods they serviced. Throughout the city, SLAF personnel, recognizable for the dark colored clothing, caps and boots, were deployed for building new public spaces and tending gardens. These in turn were gentrified theaters for global pageants like the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that demanded urban rationalization at a magnificent scale. From Colombo, high-speed expressways snaked across the country, their panoptic tentacles gathering in the sovereign nation. The new public sphere simulated democracy aestheticizing venues for public participation by removing the physical barriers of the wartime decades. The post for subject was being individuated as a civic minded, health conscious, productive body, treading prescribed paths, where paving, drainage systems, planting and lawn were carefully demarcated and defined. This disciplining process, their education into modern citizenship, was superficially transparent. Physical barricades were replaced by ubiquitous forms of human surveillance and vigilant police and army personnel. They ensured safety for the wealthy and conformity of the poor. A microcosmic representation of this transformation was evident at the urban wetland park, valley or sand park at Navalero Nugegoda involving the Sri Lankan Army, Navy Land Reclamation Department, and UDA. The project, which began in June 2012, involved cleaning up the adjacent canal and rebuilding the 18-acre site. 
a footpath, solar powered lighting, and boat service along the canal from the Avanda Lake, that is uh, near the Parliament, to Vellavatta, were proposed. The park is part of a canal development project focused on marshlands. It was produced to the exclusion of behaviors associated with poverty, vagrancy, and unruliness, as evident in its signage. And there were so many signs in this park that you, know, you couldn't move anywhere in it without encountering one of these uh, signs. The presence of armed soldiers and environmental police ensured that these rules were met. The insertion of an armored car as a children's plaything illustrated the militarization that underwrote civic change. At a social level, we were witnessing what Jürgen Habermas described as the creation of a bourgeois public sphere. The reproduction of Colombo and Jawadanpura with the eager complicity of their property middle-class residents simultaneously displaces the urban poor. Easy informal sociality around public amenities is replaced by individual properties and amenities, imposing new forms of discipline for user education. The spaces left in their wake are claimed for new businesses and recreational precincts for the proper public of the middle-income nation. The militarization of the civic sphere was taken for granted as an extension of wartime securitization. The withdrawal of which signaled the much anticipated political peace. But these changes in the commercial capital, the recipient entrepot for neoliberal interventions, and the rescripting of the vacant lands around the parliament were equally indicative of social transformations within the nation state. So here you can see that around the parliament, the entire precinct was then redeveloped with pedestrian walkways. Social indicators like radical changes in labor, internal displacement, evictions, and demographic shifts seldom entered the cultural representations of the city. The many ways in which sovereignty is embodied or encoded, but also manipulated to exclude or diminish these factors, and through that the visibility and rights of minorities was being inscribed in the metropolitan text. Let us return to architecture, a discipline whose role as a service provider makes it overly dependent on the fiscal opportunities and clients it cultivates. Are the social special transformations of Sri Lanka's physical landscape and the needs of its minority populations beyond architecture's reach? When I began my research, I searched widely for architectural analyses of partition as possible precedents on which to build. At that time, I could not find any. More recently, two projects by Rahul Merotra and Farhan Karim have subjected this episode of monumental violence to architectural scrutiny, a period over 70 years after the event. I hope that the methods I presented today will encourage architectural scholars of South Asia to overcome the prejudices of community and politics to engage with these difficult histories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hanoma, for that brilliant talk. Um, you know, I, I think it sort of also placed, you know, opened up the whole sort of politics of the way we look at architectural space. And I think we're, everyone is sort of familiar with the architecture of Sri Lanka. But I think what you brought in is a very, very interesting framework uh, to, you know, rethink some of those frames through which we have been habituated to think of the architecture in Sri Lanka. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that, I mean, there's several questions, uh, you know, and uh, very interesting, you kind of, you know, uh, I think somewhere in your in in uh, and this article that you've written that you've also shared, uh, you were also looking at um, you know the works of other other contemporaries who've been opening up for us this kind of space of um, you know uh, of conflict 
um, and the tools through which you know architectural um, uh, architectural tools have been reframed to you know look at the space of conflict. And I'm thinking of the works of Al Wiseman, for example, right? Like how he the, the whole idea of of the architecture of forensics, um, and you yeah. know sort of very interestingly also used the the tool of the map right like the tool of the map to sort of start opening up uh, some of those those questions of you know where conflicts arise and and sort of the relationships between things um would would you kind of like to talk a little bit more about like these tools of of architecture which we otherwise take for granted and how yeah they so imagined yes yes thank you rupali so um i did look at uh, Al Weisman's work and also um, at the whole idea of war architecture in Sarajevo and but I was in some ways disappointed that we didn't have an equivalent body of um, sort of architecture scholarship from our region. Um, I, uh, I did write a subsequent book which is called Architecture on the Borderline, uh, Boundary Politics and Built Space, which was kind of a response to that. Um, where it's more an anthology and there are several writers who have contributed to that. And I look at borders more closely. So I guess these two books, which are both were published last year, are really my take on borders. Um, I'm trying to understand how these spaces which don't have sufficient materiality to warrant architectural attention in the canonical sense, um, can be brought into architectural studies. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, there's, there's work on camps in, um, for instance, in France, the refugee camps, so all the refugee camps that were set up in uh, Europe uh, are an interesting kind of phenomenon to look at. And there were other border conflicts around heritage, uh, UNESCO heritage uh, nominations, there were border conflicts around um, specific um, histories of displacement. I myself wrote on um, the Japanese American incarceration during the war and the expulsion uh, or exchange of Muslim and um, Greek populations during the uh, you know 1923 sort of. Um, um, population exchange between Turkey and Greece. So these were all spaces which then produce particular kinds of artifacts, architectural artifacts. Sometimes they were, you know, urban, they were camps. Sometimes they were buildings like refugee houses. Um, they were all sort of so um, fragile in their materiality that it was hard to write about it. And I think now increasingly in our design studios, we are beginning to address these kinds of issues. And we're trying to teach students to begin to understand what these spaces are like. But for a long time, the design studios tended to be more conservative in what they, you know, because they were trying to answer to the profession's accreditation criteria and couldn't be so exploratory. So I guess that's the space I've kind of been working in. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you know, the other thing that really sort of struck me in the talk is this kind of conflation of the idea of development and, and the military, you know? Uh, yeah. The defense, uh, you, I mean, you spoke about the idea of the defense ministry and the urban development ministry actually kind of, you know, conflating in, in Sri Lanka. And, and it's kind of fascinating because in some ways there are in a lot of developments, you know, the sort of, um, uh, contemporary neoliberal sort of developments, we see undercurrents, you know, in most yeah. places. But here it seems like it's, you know, it's there, it's in your face and, you know, that's what... That's true. Um, I, you know, what, what is the current sort of status of that and how, how do you see the future uh, of, of this kind of conflation? So I guess what happens is with, like, for instance, during the COVID period, again, the military... Um, became useful for the government in order to managing the crisis. So I think what happens is every time there's a crisis, the possibility of demilitarization becomes more remote. And I think the important thing to understand is to have a civil police force 
I mean, that's what you aspire to, to be able to manage your country um, without that, without bringing in the military, right? You want to be able to manage it, to maintain democracy, you actually have to have that difference. Um, and the problem with countries that are coming out of war is that they are in such unsettled uh, scenarios politically that there is always some reason to just stretch that deadline a little longer. So, you know, the COVID crisis brings them back in a particular way. Or I guess it's important to understand that um, in Asia, it has always been that way. There's always been sort of the internal security regulations that was put in place during World War II, being maintained in Southeast Asia in different forms, you know, as this kind of, or even um, sort of the emergency regulations, right? Being brought in at particular moments, um, so these kinds of ways in which that then becomes a mechanism for land reclamation or the way corporations start using securitized systems or even the military in order to take land away from, uh, from groups that are resisting you know, takeovers. So it's sort of what it does is it normalizes violence in particular ways. And um, the problem is that when you're in a post-war situation, you're so relieved that the war is over, that you accept a lot of things that you would not under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you kind of, you turn a blind eye to um, these, these mechanisms that have crossed the boundaries of what is a proper public sphere. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we need to watch out for. But I think there's something else I'm also trying to say, which is that we need to be really careful, especially in South Asia, that um, we don't make the majoritarian culture the normative culture. And I think architects do that quite often. I mean, they may, um, they may invoke cosmic templates or um, religious ideas or cultural tropes in a way that's very poetic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But do, you know, unintentionally perhaps marginalize, you know, groups and make them unable to um, relate to buildings that are very important to the nation. And I think that understanding Sri Lankans have not grasped that yet. And you can still find in architectural culture, the celebration of particular things, which after such a bitter civil war, you would be so careful not to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a fantastic that. important point you made. And uh, several times in architectural discourse, there is almost this kind of benign, uh, you know, uh, idea of, of sort of uh, mobilizing the metaphor, uh, but often not realizing that you are so actually supporting major majoritarian politics and, and sort of, you know, so I think that's a very important point. And it's important to sort of highlight that in, in also the architectural circles, you know, which which almost normalize some of this kind of language. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have a couple of questions. I'm going to take some of those questions. I have one more question for you, but I'll come back with mine. Um, Devendra Kumar is saying excellent presentation. Thank you for that. Can you elaborate more on how religious moral ideas are spatially represented that in turn speaks about ideas of sovereignty and social political order. How can we learn it? How religious moral ideas uh, are spatial and represent, no, I'm sorry, sorry. Can you, uh, Devendra, can you please uh, uh, reframe that question? It's a little difficult to understand exactly what it is. Is it possible? I come back to you. Thank you so much for the question but it's a kind of slightly difficult to understand it. Is it possible for you to reframe it? Thank you so much. Uh, I, understand. I might yeah. interpret what you're saying. So I think like when I was describing the different ways in which national development proceeded in after 1978, there were particular, um, because it was you know, funded by a lot of Western donor agencies, because there was this, you know, huge amount of capital coming into the country. And because it was in the population a, a resistance to that kind of capitalism, it was 
in a kind of religious morality. And so the invocation of these religious moral ideas was in some ways to make it more palatable for a population who had subsisted on a moral economy throughout a so pro-socialist period, right? So there, these were agricultural you know, communities and they had subsistence economies and to them, any kind of excess that was coming with capitalism was, it was abhorrent to them. So you can see that what the Jawadana government was doing is they were trying to clothe or mask all these capitalist interventions in a rhetoric of morality so that it was more acceptable. So this was done um, in order to make it more palatable in order to make capitalism acceptable. Um, and you know that I think may be what Devendra is asking about. Yeah. Sorry, David. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not a problem. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, Rishikesh Pandit is asking, thanks for a wonderful presentation, Anoma. You mentioned about how building courtyard is of reducing interaction with neighbors and thereby the idea of safety in the civil war period. Can you elaborate on this and how did that shape the way we see courtyards in Sri Lankan buildings today? So what happened was that um, kind of, I mean, this is also even evident in the, um, so during the 1970s, there was a sort of insurrection in Colombo, in Sri Lanka of a sort of, uh, um, a particular, uh, like a liberation group based on sort of Marxist ideas, Marxist Maoist kind of ideas. And they were very much against the wealthy classes. And that was the beginning of the sort of desire to barricade yourself, to, to protect yourself. It was violently quelled. It was a violent movement that was violently quelled. And that was the first uh, kind of episode of politicized violence of that kind. Um, and then from that point onward, 1977, the ethnic pogrom, then 1983, ethnic pogrom, et cetera, there were these series of violent events that made people increasingly begin to um, retreat and barricade themselves. Um, and the walls of the houses went up. Yeah, the boundary walls went up to two, three stories and became the walls of the houses, creating these internalized courtyard spaces that uh, you, know, you, might associate it with, you might associate with the Middle East or you know, places like that. Very sort of defensive architecture. And once you were inside that architecture, of course it was wonderfully open and there were the courtyards and the light flowed in and there was colorful sort of um, articulation of the volumetric, um, uh, spaces within it. So they were equally innovative. But the fact is that from the street level, they basically built up to the boundary wall and they refused interaction with the streets. So the streets became almost like um, you, were walk, you were walking through a walled city. The pedestrian experience of the street was diminished. The neighborhood character was affected. Um, so this, this was a kind of withdrawal from the public sphere. And I've written about it calling it stealth architecture, a kind of stealth architecture, which is a term I take from the Los Angeles stealth architecture, where they are disguising their wealth behind this kind of architecture because of the urban violence that is happening outside. So similar phenomena, and they're very beautiful houses. A lot of the talented architects created these houses and they've been published, uh, but you have to understand the circumstances that gave rise to them, that they were produced because of the historical forces that made it difficult to engage with the city. Absolutely. I mean, that's a very important point because, again, when we think of architecture, I mean, there's always a kind of elemental sort of, uh, you know, ways in which we think of architecture. Architectural theory sort of starts looking at typology and, and, and the idea of courtyards but one has to sort of understand where those courtyards come from and you know how what what are some of the undercurrents through which society shapes some of them you know so i think very interesting point there's uh, abu siddiqui uh, who's saying thank you very much for your presentation architecture art music creativity 
in general breaks down boundaries, creates harmony, and creates opportunities for the societies to coexist. When a crisis happens, the society is in shock, uncertain, and looks for guidance. The society has a responsibility to each other to look out for each other despite their religion, race, gender, sexuality. Likewise, the government plays a huge role in accommodating the civil society's needs. Architects, urban planners, city planners also play a huge role in shaping the society. How do you feel the professionals from the built environment and the students who are studying these subjects play a role in shaping the society and breaking down boundaries? So I think education is important. So when we educate students, we need to um, conceive programs that would allow them to explore, especially in Sri Lanka, ways of collaborating across ethnicity. And I think that rather than create ethnic compartments, we need to actually find ways in which they can come together and find commonalities. The problem is that throughout the civil war, our sense of being ethnic hardened and grew more solid when in fact, you know, before the war, we identified as professionals, we identified as generations. Like my generation had such a different experience because we came from socialism to capitalism than say my parents' generation who were at the end of colonization, yeah? So generationally, we actually had no, no commonalities. So what I'm saying is if you think about as architects, we relate to one another in particular ways. Um, as a generation, we, in a, through gender, we relate in different ways. And all these ways of relating were shut down in favor of ethnicity. And ethnicity became the one and only way in which you could identify yourself. And one of the theories I also use is intersectional theory. I mean, I didn't have sort of the, the space to explore it, but a lot of my main insights for this book came from speaking to and interviewing um, people who are of mixed parentage. So people who had either Tamil or Sinhala, you know, Tamil and Sinhala parents. And what was wonderful about their worldviews is that they were not compelled to take one or other position. And so they were able to allow me to understand what this, this meeting point could be. And that was actually the basis of my book. It was asking whether there were other things that actually we could identify with, which would allow us to actually cross these ethnic boundaries. Um, so, yeah, so that's one of them. Um, so we have three more, three more questions. Uh, Maitri Dore is saying again, very illuminating. Thanks. My question is how much of a role does the colonial past play in architectural and urban development today? It seems like the war is constantly referenced and architecture borrows from majoritarian motives, but is there also a colonial hangover in any way or an attempt to invoke or address that part of the country's history? So, you know, I kind of, um, for a long time, I've been writing in the post-colonial mode, right? So in the post-colonial mode, you always look to the colonial past in order to understand the problems of the present. Um, in this book, I actually, so in the book that I wrote on um, architecture and nationalism in Sri Lanka, it was very much a post-colonial book. In this book, I shifted the Cold War. And the reason I did that was because I felt that the generation that I am in, which is the generation that kind of were adults during the duration of the conflict, were affected more by the Cold War than by colonization because of the distance from that colonial event, the end of colonization. Um, my parents' generation who had written the history books and written post-colonial theory were very affected by colonization. But for me, the Cold War was more, it, it's, it's a kind of, um, how can I say, it's a embodied kind of dichotomy, the Cold War. Because I was already, you know, I was 11 or 12 when we became, uh, when the economy was liberalized. So I felt it viscerally, that shift in everything from the things we ate to the way we dressed, to the introduction of television, our worlds changed. And that change was internal to my life 
uh, my timeline of my life. And I felt that that was what actually um, raised the stakes on what it meant to be ethnic and what advantages you could get out of the capital that was flowing into the country. Um, so in some ways, I kind of, I guess I let go of the first colonial uh, and moved into a kind of Cold War discussion. And I'm kind of interested in that, that shift because, um, you know, I've been looking at some of the um, histories of partition and Pakistan, which is very much caught in the Cold War, right? The sort of way in which American aid comes into Pakistan and funds certain kinds of projects. And, you know, there's this whole kind of greater Cold War struggle, but we have never really thought about it like that because we've always been thinking of it in the post-colonial mode. And I just feel like we need more writing in that, that other space now. I mean, for yeah. us, it's the, the institutionalization that happens, you know, certain kind of our own kind of curriculums and architecture, you know, are sort of deeply embedded in colonial. Of course, of course. Politics. So I, and still continues. In fact, some of this, you know, uh, non-critical um, sort of thinking uh, in, in architectural space sort of comes from the whole sort of baggage that we have of, uh, you know. Yeah. So I think decolonization, for me, decolonization is very important. And institutional decolonization, which is what you're describing, has to happen, and it hasn't. Um, there has been a nationalization, but not a decolonization, right? Um, I mean, in Australia, they're still, they're kind of still in colonial mode in most of the, most of the ways. They haven't really, they don't have the need to decolonize. Um, in Sri Lanka, I would say, because the RIBA accreditation process Govern the education system for so long, unlike in India, um, the colonial system was far more um, controlling. Yeah, those far more than what you are experiencing. So India kind of let go of it. I know some schools kind of stuck with uh, the colonial curricula, but I think India's um, professional uh, accreditation and uh, licensing system was not as dependent on Reba, right? Yeah, but in the sense that it can, there was a, the baggage of, you know, the curriculum still continued. Institutions yeah. may have sort of disconnected, but the content itself sort of, you know, continued for a very long time and sort of shaped minds also, right? Also, and I, I think more so also, um, say Sri Lanka is comparable to Singapore and Hong Kong, which also had that accreditation system in place. I mean, when I was in um, my undergraduate in Sri Lanka, um, that was the moment when, so up to my kind of second year, students had to do two exams. One was the Reba exam for the same subject, and then the other was the local exam. And so if you had 10 papers that you had to do, you had to do 20 papers. It was just ridiculous. And then they would have the Reba examiners come at the end of the year and examine the projects. And, you know, there was this whole hoo-ha around this, you know, this gaze of the, of the Reba. And even now they are like, you know, they're really conscious of Reba accreditation and whether they'll get it and whether they won't and which school has got it and which hasn't. And you begin to think, you know, it's so colonial that it's a real hangout. So yes, I mean, I think in that sense, definitely, um, the failure to decolonize is, is very clear. So uh, yeah, so Anuj uh, is asking, Bawa has become synonymous with Sri Lanka's modernism to an extent that we almost overlook the turbulent history of the civil war and its subsequent influences on architecture. Uh, so he's asking, you know, whether, and, and several artists have been dealing with this in their own work, you mentioned, Chanathanan's work and you know we're very familiar with that work as well but he's also asking whether young architects come to address these issues um, in the in in architecture and the public realm whether there's a awareness of that in architectural education in Sri Lanka as well so there has I mean I'm not involved in um, teaching in Sri Lanka so I can't really tell you what the curriculum are, uh, the curricula are like there's a certain amount of engagement um, with local conditions, certainly, um, from what I understand. 
but we don't have a history theory stream, right? So we can't really have that kind of deep critical engagement. Um, and I think that, as I was mentioning to you, Rupali, earlier, is one of the, I think, the next step for South Asia is to really develop strong history theory criticism streams and at least educate a few people that will become the historians of the next generation. Because otherwise, everybody is going to always have to leave the countries to be able to be historians, you know, to be able to do the kind of critical theoretical thinking that we are doing. So um, I think it's because the professional schools are very pragmatic in the way they see the curriculum. It's how you serve the profession. And there isn't an understanding of the need for that kind of intellectual critical awareness as the foundation for the profession. Um, and I guess we need to work towards that. So uh, Mani, is, uh, was water uh, resources controlled on a regional level through dams and on city level through biased water distribution system. How did it reflect on the built form? So he must be talking about the hydro kind of electric projects, right? That, you know, that I was describing. So um, I guess for Sri Lanka, the, that was the major kind of um, development program was the harnessing of the Mahavali River, which is this very large river that is the largest river in the country going from the central hills down to Trincomalee. Um, and what it did was it allowed the reservoirs um, enabled colonization of new areas of forest lands for people to be able to cultivate. So it was very much about agricultural um, industrializing agriculture at a, a kind of level through water management. Um, it's more about agriculture than about water distribution. Um, it's about, you know, hydroelectric power. And then it's about settlements, agricultural settlements. So it doesn't really impact architecture in the way that he's asking. So, there were the kind of settlement designs yeah. and uh, the architect Ulrich Plesner was involved in the Mahavali schemes, the housing for the Mahavali schemes um, in the second time he came to Sri Lanka. So he's the partner of Jeffrey Bava for a while. They worked together. Um, he's the Danish architect who uh, his particular strain of Danish humanism influenced Bava in his work and Pleasant was very interested in the vernacular. He went around documenting vernacular buildings. So he brought that aspect also into the practice. So that, so in the later period, he worked on those Mahavari settlements. Interesting. Um, so Abu Siddiqui again uh, uh, is asking, I think he's also from the UK. So he's asking the Reba exams, um, you know, do because in, I think in the UK they don't have to give an exam. It's only the projects that are marked. Uh, so, is it still the case that you know the students have to get a Reba re uh, recognition now? Um, um, yeah, they do get Reba recognition, but they have their own exams. So the school runs its own exams. Yeah, so it's um, not but I, I don't. I still think the examiners come for the design. The wow. design exam, yeah. I'm not sure though, I, I have to check that. Yeah, so maybe Mr. Abu Siddiqui, you can have a chat with uh, Anoma. Yeah. You'll have to ask someone who, at the university at Katubad that they still bring the examiners down or yeah. Singapore or Hong Kong. Yeah. I don't know if they do. Yeah, the next, next week, we also have somebody from the University of Moratoa coming and maybe you can ask them that question then as well. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So Dipali Modi is saying the Mahaveli was also seen as a colonization of traditional Tamil lands, don't you think? Um, yeah, because there were some schemes that were set up towards the Trincomalee end of the scheme where the settlements, um, so that, that also was a point of contention between the LTT and the government, 
was that there were certain schemes that were set up, colonization schemes that um, encroached on lands that were traditionally of in Tamil areas. Um, and that became a scene of a terrible massacre as well. So that was part of it. But it was basically these three development plans that I mentioned, and also the um, export-oriented garment manufacturers, the factories that were set up, none of them reached the North and the East. There was a scheme for expanding the Mahavali towards the North, but it was shut down by parliamentarians. So there was a deliberate, um, it was certainly a deliberate uh, kind of neglect of the minority areas. Um, that's fairly well documented. Yeah, I think we are done with the questions, but really thank you so much, Anoma. It has been a really, uh, you know, wonderful, illuminating sort of experience. Um, you know, I think for us also, you've pushed the boundaries of, uh, you know, architectural thinking and particularly our own sort of, you know, knowledge of, of architecture in Sri Lanka. So fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we really hope you can stay in touch with us for our other sessions. Um, and also, you know, I mean, we, we like to call uh, our, our invitees, our friends, and we really sort of, you know, uh, hope to have a long standing engagement with them because it's, I think it's, this is only the beginning. And like you said, it's really important in South Asia to build a kind of strong, uh, you know, a history theory course and, and a crit kind of critical engagement. Um, and we'll be very, very happy to kind of have you on board to, you know, help us to kind of expand this because I think we, we really believe that we need to strengthen our institutions here. Um, and we are trying our best, but like we said, you know, it, it, the, the contemporary is so close to us that we need you know, a collective thinking and a collective imagination to, you know, see our present through. And, and I think it's fantastic to have so many partners in South Asia, you know, who are working in on South Asia to you that are kind of coming in and bringing to us this kind of critical discourse. So thank you so much. Um, and we stay in touch. And I would really also like to thank my, the entire team at the School of Environment and Architecture, which has been fantastic. And you know, putting together the logistics of this, it's a, you know, this online uh, discussion. It's fantastic that we've been able to open up the discussion to so many from across the world from here. Um, I would really like to thank particularly Ditti and Anuj who have been involved in it and Dushant uh, uh, who has really sort of, you know, helped put together the backbone of this talk. Um, and I would also like to thank the Urban Design Research Institute for partly funding this and supporting us through our journeys. Um, and thank you, Anoma. We are, you know, this is only the beginning of our friendship and we stay in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to the audience also to, uh, for tolerating us. Thank you. Thank you so much. The audience, I mean, fantastic questions and you're such an alive uh, and intelligent audience. So thank you so much for this. Okay. Bye. So Rupali, then I just I'm just going to leave and yes, yes. yeah.